pray that you'll be blessed because you're here today. Does everyone have a church bulletin? If not, raise your hand and we'll get you a church bulletin. Our ushers are walking around now, ready to give you one. All right. Well, today is Veterans Day. Uh, I'm sorry, Tuesday is Veterans Day, and uh, it's a day that we remember those who sacrificed for the freedoms that, that we enjoy in our, our country. Some gave some, some gave all. You know, they gave up their comfort, their, their safety, their future, hope, their dreams, their family and friends, and as I said, some gave their all. So Veterans Day is more than just a day off from work or a holiday. Veterans Day is a time that we remember uh, those who sacrificed for the freedom that we enjoy here today, the freedom to worship, and the freedom that's slowly be eroded in our, in our country. So I'd like to just take a moment to, to have a moment of silence, and let's remember those who sacrifice so much for the freedoms we enjoy. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for those who have sacrificed so that we could live in this free country. And though America has its problems, we're still the best place to live. So, Father, I thank you for those who have given uh, their lives, who have sacrificed so much. Most of all, we thank you, Father, that you have sacrificed your son so that we can enjoy freedom because your word says that if we have the son, then we're free indeed. So, Father, as we worship you here this morning, let us worship you here in spirit and in truth. May you bless all that happens here today. May you be glorified. May you be lifted up. May you pour out your spirit upon us. And may we, we just encounter you here today as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, bless this time. Use me as your instrument to speak through this morning. I pray that you would remove any barriers, any hindrances, any obstacles that, that Satan may put in our way, Father Lord. Let us just truly worship you here today. Let us leave changed. Let us leave knowing we have heard you and that we have encountered you here today. Refresh us with your presence. Breathe into our hearts and our lives and, and strengthen us. Give us a, a renewed sense of, of purpose and, and passion for you, Father. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Gary, I don't know, can you put up that? Well, he's good. Gary, Gary is good. Well, I asked him to put this up. This is from what? A portion of the what? Declaration of Independence, Okay. And it says, I don't know if you can read it, uh, it was bigger, I don't know why it got smaller, it, but it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And I want you to notice that our founding fathers, they made no allowances for evolution, did they? It says that they are endowed by their creator, so they believed in God. We're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, moral rights and truths that the government cannot give or take away. These rights are from God. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And our founding fathers understood that the government doesn't give us these rights. Our government recognized that these come from God. And our government... Uh, uh, was established to uphold these rights, not give us these rights. The Mayflower Compact, November 1620. This is the document that gave direction to this nation. I'm just going to read you a short portion of it. In the name of God Almighty, we whose names are underwritten, having undertaken for the glory of God 
and advancement of the Christian faith. Did you hear that? That's our founding fathers. Why did they come to this nation? For the advancement of the Christian faith. A voyage to plan the first colony in northern Virginia do by these present solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body. Our founding fathers believed that this new Christian nation would glorify God. They came to this nation to, to advance Christianity. Their authority came from God. I went on a, a spiritual heritage tour of our nation's capital one time, and uh, I'm amazed at, at how Christianity, our Christian faith, is so intertwined with, with our, uh, our founding fathers. You know they used to worship in the Capitol building? Until after the Civil War, it was packed out in there. It was full for worship services. Uh, to me, that's, that, that's just amazing. You know, America is a Christian nation because Christians founded this nation. Christians founded this nation upon Christian principles. Christians wrote the Declaration of Independence. Christians wrote our Constitution. And Christian, Christianity is the largest religion in America. But America is turning away from her Christian roots. Today it's prohibited to read Scripture in school. Do you know the Bible was their only textbook at one time? And today it's prohibited to pray in, in school, to pray in Jesus' name, or to have a, a manger scene in public places. America is turning away from her Christian heritage and from recognizing God as creator. And we're even rewriting our history to exclude any reference to God, the Bible, Jesus Christ, or the cross. For example... The U.S. Capitol Visit Visitor Center, CVC, was refurbished and opened to the public December 2008 at a cost of $621 million. When Senator Jim DeMint of South Carolina took a tour, he was dismayed to find all reference to God and our American Christian heritage scrubbed out. Some examples, the words of In God We Trust were omitted from the House Speaker's chair. And the Bible that was on the table during Lincoln's second inauguration was erased. We're erasing our, our Christian heritage. We're rewriting history, denying our Christian heritage. The College of William and Mary, the nation's oldest, was established in 1693. Well, in November 2006, the college decided to remove a cross from the campus chapel because the cross was offensive to non-Christians. That's, that's our heritage. That's our Christian heritage. America is turning away from our Christian heritage. Uh, you know, our President Obama even declared, whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. We have changed. We, we've forgotten our Christian roots. We're erasing our Christian roots. I understand that other faiths live in America. I get that. I, I understand that. But should we change our history to accommodate them? No, absolutely not. Should we rewrite history because... It may offend some people. No. What's ironic, when I was in Connecticut and Hartford, the, the, the Muslims were having a conference there under the banner of religious freedom. Isn't that ironic? Try having a religious freedom conference in a Muslim country, right? So what should we do? I'm, I'm not just going to present you with a problem. I'm going to present us with a solution. Because I, if you look at the title of the sermon, as the church goes... So goes America. So if America's get, tell me what you want. Darkness cannot overcome light. It can't overcome light. So if America is getting darker, it's because the light's not shining. And by the light, I mean the church. You see, our problem is not with Democrats. Our problem is not with Republicans. Our problem is with the churches. As the church goes, so goes America. Our hope is not in who sits in the White House. Our hope is who sits on the throne in heaven. Amen? Back in 1998, there was a Newsweek article. And the title of the article was Shame. How do we bring back a sense of right and wrong? And that's a Newsweek article, understand. The article goes on to quote Bob Woodard, who said, 90% of Americans say they believe in God, yet the urgent sense of personal sin has all but disappeared in the current upbeat style in American religion. 
In the early years, ministers regularly exhorted congregations to humbly confess their sins. But the aging baby boomers who are rushing back to church do not want to hear sermons that rattle their self-esteem. And many clergy who are competing in a buyer's market feel they can't afford to alienate. Understand something, church. My job is not to market religion. My job is not to fill a pulpit. My job is not to pander to people's desires. My job is to fill the pulpit. And my job is to say, thus saith the Lord, whether people will hear it or not. Amen? And that's what the churches in America need to get back to. We're a nation. We've turned our back on God. We want life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness apart from God. And it, it's not going to happen. So what do we do? Well, we don't need to point our fingers at non-Christians and rebellious unbelievers because they're just acting according to their nature. We must act according to our nature and be the salt and the light that the Lord called us to do. We need to, to rise up and be change agents in this world. Evil prospers when good does nothing. I think the churches have had their head in the sand too long. And we need to stay, take a stand for the truth, a bold stand, a loving stand for the, for the truth. And understand, Jesus did not just call us to go to church. He called us to be the church, to be the church, to be change agents in, in this world. Today I want to look at one of the seven churches in Revelation. In Jesus' letter to the seven churches, there's always a pattern in Revelation. There's a positive affirmation. He tells them all the good things they do. And then words of corre correction. He always says, but, or yet. And then eternal motivation. I want to look at Revelation chapter 2 this morning. If you would, turn to page 1868 in your pew Bible. And I think we can learn a lot from just looking at what Jesus says to this church in Revelation chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7, page 1868 in your pew Bible. Are we there? Somebody's working on it, I heard. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll give you time. I want everyone to follow along, all right? To the angel of the church in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus means darling or love. Write these. Write. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you, have been te that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Verse 3, you have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Now here comes the, the words of correction, yet, right? Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. I'm sorry, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give him the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now notice in, in verse 1 it says, the seven stars, the seven stars. These are the pastors of the churches, and the seven golden lampstands are the churches. Well, how do I know that? Well, if you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, it tells us. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. Can't go wrong when you allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So here the term, what, what's, a, what's angel mean? Uh, angel means messenger. That's what angel, so here, believe it or not, the term angel, is he's referring to the pastors. Not that pastors are angels, but pastors are messengers. We're messengers of, uh, of God, right? Jesus said he holds his servants in his hands, and he says he walks among his churches. So what does that say about those who don't believe in organized religion? Uh-oh, yeah, it's too bad, because God, God believes in organized religion, doesn't he? 
He's walking among his, his churches, right? This letter Jesus wrote to the church at Ephesus is just as relevant today as it was then. And from this, I want us to learn three very important truths. If you have your hand out, number one, Jesus knows all the good we do for him. He's walking among us today, too. He knows our deeds. He knows our needs. He knows our service. He knows everything about us. In the letter to the church at Ephesus, Jesus said he knew at least three things about them. A, he says he knew their hard work. Jesus said in verse 2, I know your deeds and your hard work. You know, this church at Ephesus reminds me of Cibolo Valley Baptist Church in, in, a, in a sense that they were a hard-working church. They, they did a lot. They weren't lazy. They, they did as Jesus commanded them for, to do. And you know what? We have a lot of hard workers in, in our church. We do a lot in ministry. Uh, we have a choir and praise team. We have Bible studies. We have uh, uh, teachers for Sunday school. We have children's church, VBS, Fall Fest, Awanas, youth ministry, committee meetings, back to school bash, food drive, clothes drive, mission work, building repairs. We do a lot of work. And Jesus says, I know your hard work. I know your hard work. I, I see your hard work. I'm walking among the churches, and I know your hard work. Second thing Jesus says he knows about them. He says, I know your perseverance. Look at verse 2. Jesus says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. Verse 3, Jesus said, you have persevered and have endured many hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So they were in it for the long haul, weren't they? They knew that the Christian race was not a sprint. It was a marathon. They, they endured. They, they ran with perseverance, right? And the Lord valued their, their perseverance. And I'm here to tell you this morning, the Lord values your perseverance as well. He knows of your hard work, and he values your perseverance. Because a lot of people start the Christian race, but they don't end it well, do they? So he values your, your, your perseverance. And then see, he knew their commitment to the truth. Look at verse 2. Jesus said, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and found them false. So there were false prophets back then too. But they were committed to the word of God. You know, this church, it didn't have a good start. But they had some excellent Bible teachers. How would you like to have Paul as a pastor? Right? For two years. Imagine if Paul would, would come here to Cibolo Valley Baptist Church and, and teach this church for two years. You think we'd learn something? Absolutely. And then after Paul, what if we had Timothy for a while? And then after Timothy, then we had the Apostle John come. Wow. We'd be a solid church, wouldn't we? Well, that's, that's what this church had. Look at Acts 19, starting in verse 8, page 18. Uh, I believe it's 1689 in your pew Bible. Yeah, 1689. And what's the title of chapter 19? What's it say? Paul in Ephesus, okay? Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate, and they refused to believe and malign the way. Uh, well, verse 10. This went on for how long? For two years. So Paul taught at the church of Ephesus for, for two years, and then after Paul came Timothy and then, and then John. And look at verse 19 and 20. This was the church... Uh, you know, at one time, this church was into pagan worship, the worship of, of Diana and other false gods and sorcery and evil practices. Look at, look at verse 19. A number of them had practiced sorcery, and they brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And then it says, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. They burned all their books, they, 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 they came to hear the truth of God's word. They came to believe in Jesus Christ. So they gathered all of their books on sorcery. They gathered all their books on false teaching, and they burned them. They could have got a lot of money had they sold them, by the way. 
Really. But they burned them. And then they were committed to the truth after that. They said, never again will we be led away, led astray by false teachers. We're going to be committed to the truth after this, right? You know, the best way to spot counterfeit money is to what? Know what real money looks like. Then you can spot a counterfeit. And the best way to spot a lie is to know the truth. And the church at Ephesus came to know the truth of God's word, and and the Lord commended them for that. It says, "I, I commend you for not being led away by these false teachers. You held firm to the, to the truth. You remembered what all the good teachers told you, and you held firm to, to these teachings. You see, I became a Baptist by choice. I was brought up Catholic. But I, can't, I became a Baptist by choice. Because Baptists, I believe, follow the Word of God. When Baptists quit following the Word of God, I'll quit being a Baptist. But I'll always be a Christian. I believe Baptists closely follow the Word of God. You know, too many churches today bend the truth of God's Word to be acceptable to the culture. We can't do that. We need to be the salt and the light of the culture. If this world, if America is getting darker, I believe it's because the churches are trying to blend in with the world. We're trying to be compatible. No! We're we're to stand firm on the truth of God's Word and be the salt and light. Be like the church at Ephesus, right? Stand on on God's word. Hold on to it. No compromising of the truth. Jesus commended the church at Ephesus for this, and he'll commend us as well. Number two, Jesus called them to love him supremely. Look at verse 4 of Revelation chapter 2. Don't you wish we could just stop there? They got all these uh, commendations and accolades and They're feeling pretty good about themselves. And then Jesus says, hmm, yet I hold this against you. It's like, oh, man, right? He says, you have forsaken your first love. I have a dashboard on my truck, or I used to have a dashboard on my truck. I drive a Volkswagen now. But on my old truck... I used to have lights that used to pop up a lot, warning lights. And it got to the point, I just took some black tape and I put it over the the warning. You know, because engine, I knew there was nothing wrong with the engine, you know, but there's some warning lights you can't ignore, right? When the engine starts overheating and it tells you that warning light comes on the dash, it's time to pay attention to that. No putting black tape over it. There's a warning light in your life. When it goes off, you better not ignore it. And it's when your love for the Lord grows cold. That's a warning light. That is just should be flashing, like warning, warning. What happened to your love for the Lord? Remember the things you used to do at first. How many of you here are married or have been married? You remember the courtship days, right? Remember when you, you, you met your spouse and you'd go to the favorite restaurant and you'd hold hands and write these silly notes to each other and look into each other's eyes and you'd spend up all night just talking to each other. And now it's like, hmm, hmm, yeah, well, hardly even talk, right? Just can't even get a word out of them now, right? Now, what would happen if You wanted to rekindle that romance. What would you do? You would do the things that you did when you first met. You'd go visit that old restaurant you used to go to. You'd go sit down by the lake where the lake used to... You you would do the things that you did at first to try to rekindle that romance, right? Now, what what does the Lord uh, uh, tell them to, to do here? Look at verse 5. This is the remedy. He says, you know, I, I hold this against you. Uh, uh, you have forsaken your first love. But then he gives them the, rem- uh, the remedy. He says what? Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things what? You did at first. 
If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. So just like in a, in, a, in a relationship, you do the things you did at first to rekindle, restore that relationship. So if your love for God has grown cold, what did you used to do when you first became a Christian? Man, read the Bible. Yeah, man, I couldn't get enough of the Bible. I was faithfully attending church all the time. I was always listening to Christian music. I was praying all the time. And then your heart grows cold. And then you quit doing those things. And the Lord says, you know, the first and greatest commandment is what? Love the Lord God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Why does the Lord want us to love him supremely and first? Is he an uh, egomaniac? Why do I want my wife to love me supremely? I don't want her loving any other man. Why? Because she's mine. I married her, and I love her supremely. And I want her to love me the same way that she loves me. Did I say that right? You know what I'm getting at, though, right? No, it didn't sound right. <laughs> you know what I'm getting at. All right, all right, all right. But the Lord wants us to love him uh, the same way that he loves us. And he loves us supremely. He won't settle for second or third. And he said, you know what, this church at Ephesus, man, you're doing some good work. Man, you guys, you guys are working hard. You guys are, are, are a very orthodox church. You're holding to the truth. You're, you're, you're persevering. Yet, but it's like, man, couldn't we stop there? Think of, have you ever gone to, to H-E-B and you, for some, you, I don't know about you, but I'm the guy who always gets the cart with the wheel out of whack. <laughs> Did that ever happen to you? I don't care what carriage, I'll pick the one that's, that's messed up. And I'm going through the store, and boom, right? I, I want you to picture your walk or the Christian faith as, as a cart. And there's four wheels on that cart. And there's the wheel of orthodoxy. We need the wheel of orthodoxy. We need to hold firm to the truth. And there's the, the wheel of hard work. We need the hard work. Church is not a spectator sport where 11 people run around on the field and the rest of us just watch them. We need hard workers. And we need the wheel of perseverance as well. And we need the wheel of love. We need all four wheels turning together simultaneously. And if one gets out of whack, what happened? Right? And Jesus says, you know what? You either fix your problem or I'm going to come and remove my lampstand. Either fix it or I'm going to come remove my lampstand. Fix your love problem. Another wheel analogy is if your car is out of alignment, here's your two front tires, and the two back tires should be right behind your two front tires. If they're, if they're out of alignment, they'll be off to the side, and what happens is you're dragging your back two tires. And I think that's a good analogy of thinking, what happens when we don't love God first? We get our life out of alignment. And then he's got to start dragging us along, right? The things that we used to want to do, uh, it now becomes hard work. You know, we can be orthodox, but, but uh, what, what matters most is that we have love. Because what's orthodoxy without love? It, it just becomes dry and legalistic. We, we could persevere, but if we don't have love while we're persevering, then we become proudful. We can have hard work, but if we don't have love and hard work, then, then well... Then it just becomes dry and boring and routine. Love is important to God. And he says, I know your hard work, people. I know your perseverance. I know your orthodoxy. I know you're holding firm to the truth. All good, all good, church. But, but you forgot one important thing. You neglect one important thing. And the dash light should be blinking in your life. He says, you know what? Your love for me has grown cold. It's grown cold. Do the things you used to do at first. Rekindle that love that you had for me. Return to me. He says, if you don't, I'm going to remove the lampstand. Right? Love is very important to Jesus. I never had a daughter. I got a granddaughter now. Awesome. Awesome. I know why the Lord didn't give me a daughter, because she would have me wrapped around her pinky. I know that. For this illustration, I'm going to use the father and daughter. 
Uh, I can imagine just how dear it is to have a relationship with a daughter. But this father and daughter had a dear relationship. And they used to go walking every day until one day she quit going for walks with him. And he would be walking by himself thinking, what's going on? Oh, no. And this went on for three months, and he became very discouraged and despondent. And finally it was his birthday, and she gave him some slippers that she had been working on for the past three months. That's why she didn't have time to go on a walk with him. And he, he said, you know what? Next year, buy me some slippers. He goes, because I want you more than these slippers. I want you more than, than the works. And you know what the Lord is telling some of you today? Some of you are too busy to spend time with the Lord. And he says, you know what? What's most important to me is you. You spending time with me. I don't care what you can do for me. I want that love relationship with you again. Return. Do the things that you used to do. Return to your first love that you used to have. Amen? Third, Jesus gives us the three R's to return to Him. I think I've already covered some of this, so we should breeze right through that, shouldn't we? The first R is remember. He says, remember the height from which you have fallen. Right? Do the things that you used to do at, at, at first. And then the second R is repent. In verse 5, he tells us to repent. Now, repent is not a negative word. Repent is a, is a positive word. Repentance uh, uh, is a gift from God, according to Acts 11.18. Imagine if God didn't allow us to repent. Repentance is not just feeling sorrowful, because we can feel sorry but not repent. Repentance is more than doing penance or works, because, well, we can do works but not truly repent in our heart. D.L. Moody once said, if you want pure water, don't paint the pump, clean the well. Trying to change your behavior without God's Spirit is like painting the pump. We need to repent. For those of you who don't know Jesus Christ, you need to repent and turn your life over to Him. That's repentance. And He'll clean you up. He'll, he'll clean the well. And for the rest of us who know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we need to repent and remember and return to Him and do the things we, we did at first. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll, you'll obey me. And then C, the third R is repeat. Do the things that you did at first. Right? We already talked about that. So maybe today you realize you need to spend more time with the Lord. Maybe you need to serve Him more. Maybe you need to, to pray more, come to church more, serve more, sing in the choir. I don't know, but you need to do whatever you need to do to, to stoke that fire in your heart for the Lord again. It's important to work hard. It's important to persevere. It's important to believe in the right things, but we can't just go through the motions. We have to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. What would we have left here in our church if we removed love? And, and what I mean is, think about all the things that we do here in, in church. We do a lot. And what if we, were, if we stopped doing those things that weren't motivated by love? How much would get accomplished? I would like to think that all that we do is motivated by love. But I'm here to tell you that if it's not, do you think the Lord finds it acceptable, what we're doing in service? If you're serving Him begrudgingly, because no one else will take the position, then <laughs> you might as well not serve, because the, the, the Lord doesn't want that type of service. He wants you to serve from the... Over you know, my, my wife is happy I make the bed. She's happy I make the bed. And, and I do that because I love her. I don't say, she doesn't say, oh, thank you for making the bed. And I say, no problem, it's my duty. I, 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 I don't say that. I, I serve her because I, I love her, and she wants me to serve her because I love her. She doesn't want me to do it because it's my duty. She wants the things that I do emanate from, from love. And the Lord wants us to serve Him out of what emanates from, from our heart, out of the overflow of our, 
our heart. Let's look at the fourth thing. Jesus rewards our love for him. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans. Now, the Nicolaitans, they were frauds. They were false prophets. They were seeking power, position, and, and titles. They were, they were wanting to rule over the people. And he says, I'm glad you don't like these people. You hate these people. He says, I also hate them. Then he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know what, church? We need to have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to us this morning. To him who overcomes, Jesus says, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So what's the big deal about that? I'm glad you asked. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Somebody read that when you get there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Okay, so the Lord put one tree off limits. He says you can eat from all these other trees, but you cannot eat from the knowledge of what? Good and evil. What did they do? They ate from the tree, knowledge of good and evil, after being tempted to, to do so. So after that, what did God do? I'm glad you asked. Look at Genesis 3, verse 22. Who wants to read that? Someone read that. Genesis 3, 22. Ah, now do you see the connection. So what does it say here in Revelation chapter 2? It's, he says, I will give him the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So this tree that was once off limit to us will now be in limits again. In other words, we will live forever. The Lord had to put that tree off limits. Do you know why? What would happen if we ate from that tree and we lived forever in our fallen state. Imagine being 800 years old and your body is wearing out and, and you can never die. I think it's a gift he put that tree off limits to us in our fallen state. But he has restored that tree to us. And as we eat from that tree, we can have eternal life with our new and glorious bodies. Amen. We're restored from our sinful and, and fallen nature. We can eat from the tree of life again for all those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now maybe this day you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've never, you've never done so. We want to give you an opportunity during a time of invitation. Maybe some of you need to repent and confess. You know that dash light's been going off and you've been ignoring it, putting black tape over it. Time, time to rip off that black tape. Quit ignoring that, that blinking light. Maybe you need to repent and confess to the Lord here this morning. Turn back to Him. He says, return to me. The Lord will never turn you away if you return to Him. In fact, the Bible says that if you return to the Lord, the devil's going to flee from you too. Right? Maybe you need to just renew your relationship with the Lord. Or how about joining this church? Maybe the Lord is leading you to join this church. We'll help you move your letter. Or maybe you just need prayer. Sandra's here this morning with her dad. Welcome. And Sandra will pray with you. If you need prayer, come forward this morning and Sandra will pray with you. But however the Lord leads you this morning, you respond in obedience. We're going to stand and we're going to sing hymn number 591, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. But before we sing, I'd like to, to lead us in prayer. Okay? Heavenly Father, Lord, Your word says it will not return void, but will accomplish what you desire to do. So, Father, I was your faithful instrument this morning. I pray, Father, that the words that you spoke through me will not fall on deaf ears and hard hearts, but that your spirit will come upon us this morning and quicken our hearts, quicken our minds, that you'll convince and convict us of anything that we need to, to get right with you, that we need to repent from. Maybe we just need to, to restore our love relationship with you again and to love you supremely with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
Help us, Father, to do the things that we did at first. Help us to renew that passion for you. Let us pursue you as you have pursued us. Let us love you as you love us. Father, I pray that this would be the day when we would say no to self, when we would say no to sin, and we would say yes to you, yes to following you, yes to whatever it is you call us to do, that we will not live for our own selfish desires anymore. We will not live to blend into the world, but we will take a stand and we'll say, here I am, Lord, use me, send me. Let me make a difference in this world for you, Lord. Help me to be the salt and the light that you called me to be. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Spirit upon this church. Let this church be a light on a hill. So, Father, into your hands I commit this time of invitation. May we respond however you impressed upon our hearts to respond. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.